Hello everyone and welcome back to my introduction to C series and today we are going to learn how C works starting right now. So as I mentioned before, today we're going to learn how C works, and we're going to walk through the process of actually setting this up on Linux. Now, for those of you who are using either Windows or Mac, there will be additional videos on how to cover this as well, so be on the lookout for those. So before we can jump into how C works, we need to have a discussion about how to actually make applications and the way that that works. So the overall flow that we're going to be looking at here is we're going to take something called source files, and we're going to feed that into something called a compiler, and it's going to produce what's called an application. So first off, what is source code? Source code is a collection of flat text files that exist somewhere on your computer, like the hard drive. They contain human readable code created by the programmer, and we'll see an example of that coming up soon. So source code can be any number of files. It's not limited to just one or two. Source code can contain two types of files. One of those types of files is what's known as a header file, which typically contains declarations or things that we're going to be telling the compiler up front these are coming down the road. And we'll see some examples of this in a bit. The other type of file is a C file, which is also known as a source file. And these typically contain the logic. So again, we'll see examples of these as we go on, just take them at a high level for now. So we have source code. What about the application or program as it's also called? So an application or a program is the executable program that exists somewhere on your computer. So it takes some form of input and produces some form of output. And this is basically the entire point of programming, right? It solves some sort of problem by taking an input and producing some sort of output. Applications are made up of so-called machine code that the computer understands. So while humans can read source files, the computer actually reads the program. Applications or programs can have a file extension or not. On Windows, you may see this as an .exe file. By default on Mac or Linux, there typically isn't an extension. So now that we've discussed both source files and applications, what is that part in the middle, the compiler? What exactly does that do and how does it work? Well, a compiler is a special program that takes source files as input and produces an application as its output. So if you recall, a program takes an input and produces an output. A compiler is nothing but a program that does that for us. It takes our source files that we as the programmer write and outputs an application that the computer can actually run. Some examples of some compilers might be Microsoft Visual C, GCC, which is the compiler we're going to be using, or Clang. Uh, there are others out there, many, many others out there. These are just examples of some you might run across when you're using C. So let's go ahead and get into it. I have here on the screen a installation of Ubuntu 20.04. And this is going to be what we are going to use for the next several videos. In fact, most of this series is actually going to be using Ubuntu. So if you're following along on Windows or Mac, all the steps after this point will be almost identical for the operating system that you're using. And any differences, I will go ahead and explain in those videos. But for now, to go ahead and get things set up on Linux, there are a couple of commands that we need to run. The first thing that I want to do is sort of introduce what this is. Now, for those of you who have used Linux for a while, of course, you'll be familiar with this, but this is what is known as a terminal. And it is a command line interface that allows you to run programs via text, right? So there's no buttons or anything in here to click. You enter commands on the keyboard and it executes applications. And so this is going to be the basis of all the applications that we build is going to be built uh, primarily using the terminal. And so I will as we continue on in the series, give various tidbits of information on how to use the terminal. For any other additional things that I don't cover, feel free to look it up on Google. So the first thing I'm gonna to wanna to do is I'm gonna to wanna to type something called sudo. And this is basically going to give us the permissions that we will need in order to install a couple things. The next thing I'm going to use is something called apt-get. Now this is specific to Ubuntu. And if you're running something else like Arch, obviously you probably already know how to do this. If you're running Arch or if you're running Mac, this will be slightly different. But this is basically the package manager that allows us to install various applications. So uh, apt-get is basically the program that we're going to be running with pseudo permissions. 
Next, we're going to tell it that we want to install something. So this is just a another input to the apt-get program to say, hey, we want to install something. So the first thing we want to install is GCC. And you can do this by just typing space GCC as I have here. GCC is the compiler that we will be using to build our programs. We'll also want to install something called make. That'll sort of simplify the process for us early on. And for now, that's all we need to do. So in order to actually execute this, we'll go ahead and hit enter. And you'll note that it prompts for a password. This will be the same password that you used to actually log in. The reason it prompts you for this is for security reasons to make sure that you're actually a user that should be able to do this. Once you press enter after typing your password, it will go ahead and perform the installation. I will admit that I had this previously installed on this computer, so it did not prompt me as to whether or not I wanted to actually complete the installation. It just did it. Uh, but one thing you'll need to do is it will prompt you yes or no whether or not you want to actually perform the installation by typing Y or N. You'll obviously want to type Y and continue. And if all went well, it will basically the last line here will say processing triggers from ANDB, blah, 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 and we're done. So don't pay attention to what all this stuff is. It's not really important. As long as we didn't get any errors, we know we're good to go. So I'm going to go ahead and clear this by typing clear. And I'm going to move this off to the side. Incidentally, you can get to this terminal by pressing the Windows key on your keyboard, typing term, and clicking the icon. OK, so the next thing I want to do is go ahead and set ourselves up with some source, right? So I'm actually going to close this terminal window for now. And I'm going to open my user folder, which I have a, a convenient shortcut here on the desktop. OK, and once we open this up, you'll see here that we have desktop downloads, etc. I'm just going to right click and create a new folder. And I'm going to call it development. And I'll double click to go into that. In here, I want to right click and click open in terminal. And that will open that folder in the terminal so that the current working directory, as we call it, uh, is this folder. So anything we execute will be against this folder. And that's always what we're going to want to do. So the next thing I'm going to want to do is open up a text editor, right? So I will hit the Windows key on the keyboard and type text. And text editor comes up. And we see here we have a pretty plain Jane text editor. I'm just going to change a couple options real quick. So the first thing I'm going to do is click View. And then choose Side Panel. We want to check that. That'll just give us some additional information here. Then I want to go to Preferences. And I want to go to Plugins and make sure that this File Browser panel is checked. And I'm also going to go to Font and Colors. And I like this Cobalt color scheme a lot better. It's just a little easier for me to read. So I'm going to use that. And then I've got my font size set to 16 so you guys can see it. You don't have to use this. I think the default is 13 here. Um, and that should be it for right now. So we have an untitled document here. And I'm just going to actually type some things out here and then sort of give a high level of what's going on. Okay, so I've entered some code here. There's a bunch of cryptic stuff going on on the screen. We've got all these sort of weird angle brackets here and these parentheses and semicolons and quotes and things all over the place. And we'll get to all those things in due time. But basically you'll want to enter what I have here on the screen for now and just sort of accept it at face value. And we'll dive into these things as we continue. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit Control S to save this. And I'm gonna make sure that we're in our development folder here. And I'm gonna call this file main.c. And if you, may, if you recall that .c extension is actually what tells us that this is a C source file. And you'll notice that uh, gedit here with our text editor has actually colored some of this text for us. Don't pay too much attention to that for right now, but just understand that that is there to help us uh, as an aid, as a visual aid, to be able to actually read the code a little bit easier. I know now it looks a little bit strange, but I promise these things will make sense as we dive further into it. So we have our C file. How do we actually get a program? Well, if we go back here to our terminal and we type make main and press enter, we'll note that uh, we get this output here that says cc main.c dash o main. Don't worry about this output for now. We're actually going to explain what that is in the future. But for now, uh, take a look at the file browser window over here next to our main.c. We have this other file called main here. 
and it doesn't have an extension. This is actually our generated executable that was created by our compiler. So by typing make main, it knows to actually take the file called main and create a application called main from that and compile it. And so in order to run this in the terminal, what we'll do is we'll type dot slash. And that basically tells us we want to run something in the current directory. And then from there, we'll type main and press enter. And when we do, we'll see that it says hello world, just like what we typed in here, right? And so if we look at the source, we can see that uh, we've got a whole bunch of stuff in here, but we are doing something called printing hello world. Printing is basically something that is sort of known in the computer science world as just writing out text. And that's exactly what we've done is we've written out text to our terminal here. And so we have hello world exclamation point followed by uh, this Travis at Ubuntu VM. And then we see uh, all these other weird characters here. So um, this portion that's highlighted here is actually what's known as our prompt. This is part of the terminal application that's actually currently running right now. Our program output is actually this, right? And it's a little hard to distinguish one from the other for now. So I'm gonna make a tiny modification to our program that I will explain in great detail later as to why this is. And after the exclamation point, but before the double quotation mark here, I'm gonna put a backslash n. And I'm gonna go ahead and save the file. I'm gonna come back to the terminal and type make main again and press enter. And we can see that uh, it ran without any errors, right? It didn't, it didn't give us uh, any sort of error feedback. And whenever you're running the compiler, if you didn't get any errors, that means a success generally. And you guys will see what we're talking about with errors later on. Uh, so if we go ahead and run it again by typing dot slash main, now we see that it has actually moved the cursor down to the next line for our prompt. So our prompt isn't jammed against our program output like that. This is going to be our basic workflow that we're going to use for quite some time in the series until we get a little more advanced where we'll actually switch things up. So that's all there is for this video. If you guys found this informative, please hit that like button. It helps me out a lot. Subscribe if you haven't already, and I will see you guys in the next video.